Good evening, folks. Good evening. Finally, we can get the long-awaited proposed plan meeting started here for the Velsicol chemical site here in St. Louis, Michigan. And first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out on this winter's evening, even though most of us who spend all our lives here in the Midwest know this isn't so bad. And uh, it's just a real simple agenda for tonight. Uh, we're going to have our two project managers, Tom Alcamo from the US EPA and Scott Cornelius from MDEQ. Uh, they're going to be the presenters. Uh, they've got a terrific slideshow uh, that'll give you great visuals on all the things that they propose to do and also uh, uh, show you all the different alternatives. Uh, anyone who uh, isn't on our mailing list or would like to sign in, we got some sign-in sheets here. Fine, we'll be here on the way out. You can, if you didn't sign in on the way in, you can sign in on the way out. So uh, first the presentation, then the Q&A, and then finally oral comments for those who wish to make oral comments. There are a number of ways to make written comments that are on the fact sheets. Oh, by the way, if you don't have a fact sheet, also on that table, there's some hard copies of the fact sheet that we mailed out. It tells you all the different ways. Tom will, Tom's got a slide, too, that shows you. You can make them over the internet. You can email them. You can, uh, uh, there's also a comment sheet in the fact sheet. You can write them out and send them in. So it's all up to you, but we'd like to hear from you. And, uh, and now, I guess, we'll get it started. So who's going to start off? Tom Alcamo. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I'll give you a little bit of tonight's agenda. As I said, as Mike said, we're going to do a, a presentation. It's quite a few slides. We're going to go through them pretty quickly. But in any case, um, it probably should be around 45 minutes or so. We try to make it a little bit short if we can. Have a, you know, a nice question and answer session. And then, of course, the, the public comments. So as I said, Mike said there's a court reporter here. You do not have to come up and make public comments if you so desire to. That's why we're here. You have until April 7th as long as the comments are postmarked by April 7th to submit comments. And you can email comments to the, the following email addresses on there. And also there's a, a link in the fact sheet and we have a link at the end of the presentation that'll be up that you can uh, look at that gives you additionally all these documents electronically. Okay, and what happens next is, is that both EPA and MDQ will take the public comments and we'll evaluate those public comments, we'll respond to them and then we'll choose a final remedy in something called a record of decision, and those comments will be put in the record, your comments and you know, whoever's comments, and we respond to those. So in any case, that's kind of the process that's in place, and so without further ado, we'll get started. I thought I'd just give you a little quick overview of the Superfund, like where we've been, where we're going, and where, where we're at. And essentially, where we've been is the remedial investigation. This right here, this was completed in Four phases, 2006, there was a report in the library. The last phase was completed in 2009. The purpose of that is, eventually to, is essentially to find where the contaminants are at, what are the contaminants, and is there any risk associated with those contaminants. Then the next thing we end up doing in the Superfund process is something called a feasibility study. And that basically takes the information that's gathered in the remedial investigation evaluates that information and comes up with alternatives to address the, the site risk. So where we're at today right now is in the red where we're presenting the preferred alternative. Um, if you read the document, our preferred alternative is alternative three and you'll hear more about that throughout, throughout the night. But in any case, we're at the proposed plan stage. As I said, next is this record of decision which actually finalizes the remedy. It's signed by Scott's upper managers and my upper managers that, that basically says this is, the, this is the remedy that we're going to be implementing for the Velscal plant site. And in the green is actually where we're going in terms of there's going to be design phases and construction phases. As many of you remember in terms of the, the sediment cleanup that was done out in the river, um, this will be taking place over a number of years. But in any case, you know, we still have a lot of work to do. The Velskull site from an aerial photograph. Tonight we're here to, to address the former plant site and the adjacent and nearby properties. And you can see from the, from the um, aerial photograph where those are located. 
And just to give you a little bit of quick, and probably most of you know the history, but just to, to, to digress here a little bit, Velscal Chemical bought Michigan Chemical in 65. They manufactured a wide variety of chemicals, including pesticides like DDT and fire retardant, PBB. Um, you all are aware of the accidental mixing of the, of the PBB with the uh, animal feed. The plant eventually closed in 1978. And then in the early 80s, there was a consent judgment that was um, put forth between Velsicol, EPA, and the state of Michigan. And one of the unfortunate things in that is, is that there was a, included a limited release on, from liability based on the contamination at the site. Velsicol agreed to do a containment alternative which they demolished the site facility. They put a slurry wall around the site and they capped the site. In addition, they also took another site where they used to burn waste material and brought that back to the to this plant site and put that under the cap, and that was completed in 1986. So as you all know, Velsicol's bankrupt. We ended up, EPA, the state of Michigan, and Velsicol, along with their insurance company, AIG, there was a bankruptcy settlement in 2002, and essentially for this site in St. Louis, Michigan, there was about $15 million put in this bankruptcy trust to deal with the, the site contamination. These are some pictures taken from the, the 1998 to 2006 sediment cleanup in the Pine River in which um, over 670,000 cubic yards of uh, DDD contaminated sediments was removed. The cost of that was approximately $100 million to complete that phase of the project. And unfortunately, during that cleanup, it became very obvious that the remedy that Velsicol had implemented had failed. And one thing we discovered during the sediment cleanup was is that something called DNAPL, which stands for dense non-aqueous phase liquids. And an easy way to think of that is, is if you had a glass of water and you dumped these type of chemicals in the water, it would sink to the bottom of it. Uh, these, this DNAPL is highly contaminated and it's extremely difficult to deal with. And during the sediment cleanup, this DNAPL started leaking into the, into the sediment excavation and, and we had to eventually address the, the DNAPL through um, a number of um, options, including pumping the DNAPL that we discovered, but also we ended up uh, constructing a DNAPL collection trench that's in place and being operated as we speak. This is a picture in the early 2000s of the construction of the DNAPL collection trench. You can, if I can get the cursor going here, this is the actual trench that groundwater fills up in this, and we pump that out about 20,000 gallons a week right now. But DNAPL actually seeps into here, and you can see this is the trench that relates to this, only now it's filled with gravel because of the construction. But the DNAPL flows into here, into these manholes, and we do pump that out. And we're getting about 300 gallons a year of DNAPL out of that, and that is taken off site for incineration. But we do pump, as I said, 20,000 gallons a week of groundwater out of that trench and that's taken off site for disposal. And this helps prevent DNAPL from getting into the river. And I'm gonna turn this over to Scott right now who's gonna talk about the, the remedial investigation. Good evening, I'm Scott Cornelius. I'm the project manager for the Department of Environmental Quality. My job was to plan and implement the remedial investigation I'm about to talk to to you about, and we're gonna do the Reader's Digest version of this. This document contains, uh, or takes up six, six inch three ring notebooks in the library. If you wanna read all the details, all of these documents that we're talking about tonight are over in the St. Louis Library in what, an area we call the Information Repository. So if you want to refer back after we're done talking and get a little more information, you're welcome to go over there and uh, you can see these documents that we're talking about. Uh, in 1982, uh, a remedy was put in and it was a containment remedy at this site. And one of the first questions we had is, why were we getting data that was starting to indicate that the, the containment system wasn't working? That water was leaving the containment system, and along with that water, contamination was leaving the containment system. So we evaluated in the RI, or the remedial investigation, uh, the cap, the slurry wall, and the till, which make up the containment system. We put in 163 monitoring wells. 
uh, 476 soil borings, seven rounds of groundwater sampling of all those wells, all those monitoring wells. We did residential well sampling and we sampled the soils in the adjacent neighborhood and nearby properties. It cost about $8 million to do this work. One of the things that we found was that in the slurry wall, as you can see uh, to, the, to the left, if you want to use yeah. this, you can use this. Okay, again. this is better. To the left here, this is what the slurry wall should have looked like. But what we found out, there was thinning and cracks, and during construction, uh, we believe that gravel had fallen in or dirt that caused the thinning, and sometimes it wasn't keyed in as deep as it was supposed to be into this till. And that allowed contamination to leave the system. This is a cross section, kind of a cartoon cross section of what's going on at this site. The RI discovered that we had three different uh, units for groundwater, the shallow, the, the the lower outwash unit, and we divided the lower outwash unit into two, the upper and lower intake, depending where the city wells were placed. We had this plume coming off the site, which is a perichloral, perichloral benzene sulfonic acid. And that's a material that moves very fast in the groundwater, and it was produced when DDT was produced. It's a byproduct. We also discovered that there was fractures in the till, which was supposed to stop downward movement of the contamination, and that that uh, Dean apple, or the napple, the non-aqueous phase liquid, was following in the sand seams and through those cracks and getting out of the containment system and going into the river. On the former plant site, we, we found that most of the plant site was contaminated. Soil was contaminated. We also looked at the shallow outwash unit and found that in, within that unit, and this is basically the containment system, that was all contaminated above criteria, above drinking water criteria. As we move down, and you gotta think of the shallow, and then we move down to the lower uh, upper lower outwash unit, you get, you see the contamination makes this footprint in the groundwater. And as we move down even further into the first uh, zone, we get a smaller footprint and then down further. And that's good news for the, uh, the contamination is bad news, but because there, it gets less and less as we move down through the drinking water aquifer, that's good news. Uh, and we're going to, in the remediation that Tom's going to talk about in a few minutes, he'll tell you how we're going to address that. There's two things that we found in this site that are challenges to remediate. One is that uh, NAPL or non-aqueous phase liquid. The other is the dibromochloropropane. This chemical is very toxic. It's highly volatile. And for that reason, you want to uh, take actions that don't open it up and, tr and let it volatilize off. It's, we call those uh, the principal threat areas. You can see them here in the yellow. There's two of them. And then there's other areas which we call the potential source areas where NAPA wasn't visually uh, observed like it was in the other two areas. But there are indicators, chemical indicators, such as saturation levels and solubility we use to determine that there's potential for, uh, there's potential for uh, free product to be in those areas also. And these source areas are what the remediation will focus on, and Tom will talk more about that in a second. When we went to the adjacent neighborhoods, Right next to the, the fence, the, the site's over here. This is the adjacent neighborhood. These boxes show you the extent of the soil contamination. And this is for DDT, PBB, and a couple hits of a chemical called Tris. We have, uh, 
We've done a risk assessment on this as part of the RI, a human health risk assessment, and an ecological risk assessment. And during the, when we run the human health risk assessment, we looked at 21 possible scenarios for exposure, and 13 showed to be, were shown to be unacceptable. We also, uh, we use the Part 201 as cleanup criteria for the groundwater and the soils, and those are based on risk numbers. With that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Tom to talk about the feasibility study. The feasibility study is another document that you can find in the library. It's another you know, six binders full of information that the DEQ put together to uh, sort out the different alternatives we could use to clean up the site. So Scott, as Scott mentioned, you know, the, there's unacceptable risk at the plant site, you know, and in the residential neighborhood. So we need to come up with objectives to deal with this contamination. And that's kind of the start of a feasibility study. As Scott said, it's in the library. It was finished in 2011, November. And so I said, I would encourage you if you're in, interested in a lot more detail than tonight to go read it. In any case, essentially what we want to do is prevent the ingestion, inhalation, and direct contact along with migration of any of the site-related contaminants, and that's for the soils. So it's really, let's try to address it as much as we can and prevent people from being, and ecological receptors and animals, being exposed to this stuff. Um, we also have objectives for groundwater and surface water. Again, we don't want... Um, human, humans or animals to be exposed to, to unacceptable levels in the groundwater. In addition, we've spent $100 million on the Pine River. You know, we want to protect that remedy. We don't want to let the contamination from the plant site recontaminate the river. And also, we want to prevent further migration of contaminants from the site to migrate off-site also. In addition, we want to also restore the groundwater to drinking water standards at locations where it's possible. And I'll show you this next slide where you can kind of see the area that's outside this blue line, okay? Areas in here and areas all over here, all, if there's contamination in the groundwater, we will be restoring that so you can drink that water, even though, as you'll see uh, soon, that we'll be proposing to replace the city's well field. But it's as part of Superfund, we want to keep groundwater as clean as possible. We also have objectives for the denapple. First objective is to uh, reduce, the, reduce the napple mass and mobility. So we basically, this denapple is heavily contaminated and it provides a source to groundwater and a little bit goes a long way. So in any case, we wanna try to address that and reduce that as much as possible. Um, again, we wanna prevent denapple from getting into the Pine River because if it gets into the Pine River, it affects our, our, um, our sediment cleanup. But anyways, back up here a little bit for a second too. One of the things to keep in mind also is, is that um, we will be sometime in the next number of months beginning an investigation farther downstream. There's already been some work done, but farther downstream from the dam in the Pine River to evaluate sediments downstream from the St. Louis Dam. The state has already started a large investigation and we'll be doing further work on that too, just to kind of tell you what's happening. So the feasibility study, as I mentioned, it's required by Superfund. Um, essentially, you define what alternatives and how those alternatives basically address the site contamination, looking at volumes, contamination, contamination levels, it also, what, what type of criteria do you need to do, use to basically meet the cleanup? And so we also evaluate that. We also evaluate each alternative's ability to meet evaluation criteria, including the remedial action objectives that I just talked about. And then you take these alternatives and you compare them against each other and assess, assess the relative performance of each alternative. So when the state developed the remedial investigation, they looked initially at 80 alternatives or 80 technologies. Those technologies were whittled down into eight alternatives in which they were merged into eight separate alternatives. We then took those eight alternatives 
and screened them and then came up with four cleanup alternatives that were retained for detailed analysis. Plus, it's a requirement in Superfund, we do have to look at the no action alternative. Even though we're not choosing that, it's always a requirement to look at if we did nothing. So the four action alternatives that we evaluated in the feasibility study include alternative two, which is a containment alternative, which is um, physical containment with removal of an apple. And each of these alternatives kind of build on each other. Alternative three does exactly the same thing as alternative two, but it adds treatment of those areas that Scott talked about, the, the orange areas and the, I think there were green areas, the denapple areas and the potential source areas. The fifth alternative we evaluated includes all the things that we were doing in three, but adds additional locations of soil to be treated on the site. And this, the alternative seven is a partial excavation of the site and also capping and controlling of the groundwater with the site. And all these alternatives, all these four, and we'll first talk about this, have common elements that each alternative has this in it. So that's why we want to talk about that separately because no matter what we choose, these are going to be implemented. Um, it's excavation of the soil in the residential area, replacement of the city of St. Louis's municipal water supply, groundwater extraction treatment, denapple recovery, site restoration, groundwater monitoring, and then institutional control. So this will be part, and we'll go into a little bit more detail on this um, as, as I move forward here. This gives you kind of a general overview of the conceptual excavation that could happen in the residential area. We do need to do additional sampling in there, but we estimate that there could be approximately 40,000 cubic yards of material that would be um, excavated. We're excavating it, as Scott mentioned previously, for DDT and PBB. And it's based on both an ecological and human health risk. And this ec ecological is specifically uh, uh, risk to birds. You know, DDT has a, a, a negative, a, a detrimental effect to birds. So that's one of the things we evaluated. And one of the things to keep in mind too is as we move forward in this process that we're going to be working with the property owners and residents in detail and working with them to discuss the cleanup. So in any case, this is only conceptual. There are certainly areas that are orange fenced that are going to get excavated, but we need to do additional additional sampling to further define those areas. And we'll be meeting with each resident individually to discuss you know, this additional sampling, but also as we move forward, how we're gonna do, do the cleanup and things like that. So you know, we wanna have the public involvement. We're certainly aware that you know, we come to the, somebody's property and we're excavating their, their property. I think as me as a homeowner, I would be concerned also, and we'll be working in close concert with them to discuss things how we're gonna do. For example, if there's a bush, we need to excavate the bush, we replace the bush, and things like that. So more detail will happen in the future regarding that. Replacement of the city well supply. Um, as you know, the well field is contaminated with perichlorobenzene sulfonic acid. Um, the city of St. Louis has recently formed a joint water authority with the city of Alma. And EPA and the state will be paying for the replacement of the city well field. Um, it's not only a cost savings, to move the well field from EPA's perspective, from the state's perspective, it also addresses the site risk to the, to the um, groundwater or to the, to the drinking water. Another thing that's part of all the alternatives is, is um, extracting the groundwater and treating it. Its purpose to control groundwater flow. Um, it's done through a series of extraction wells and this kind of gives you a little bit of cartoons of the different levels as Scott talked about at the site of how the groundwater will be contained. The blue is how we will contain the groundwater. It gives a modeling of how the, how the contaminants are captured and which will be treated on site. Again, as I said, there'll be an on-site on water treatment plant on the site and it's gonna be a fairly sophisticated facility. I've been with EPA, oh, 20, almost 25 years and built a number of water treatment plants, and this is probably gonna be one of the most sophisticated ones I've seen. In any case, it's gonna have a denapple separation for water, there's gonna be metals removal, there'll be a number of different treatment trains or treatment processes in place, and it'll, water will be discharged to the Pine River and it'll be based on a permit that the state of Michigan will give, give um, EPA to ensure that the Pine River is protected from the 
from, from the site chemicals because those chemicals will be cleaned in this water treatment plant and discharged. Um, as I mentioned previously, I showed you the Denapo collection trench previously. That's going to be part of the preferred alternative. And you can see that where the arrows show that that's where the, the trench is located. In addition, you can see a new location where we might have to extend the trench to within the river. And also there's a location there where we're going to try to pump the apple at about 100 feet and take that and treat that um, and remove that because that is a, a source to groundwater. Also there's site restoration. You know, the site's going to be regraded. It'll look much different than it looks now. Um, it's going to be seeded and mulched. Um, there will be a new on-site groundwater treatment plant. Um, redevelopment is possible on portions of the site. And we'll be including the community, and when we discuss reuse planning, there'll be a community involvement associated with that. There's also an existing groundwater monitoring network that's in place that will be optimizing and improving as we move forward to ensure that the site remedy is operating as designed. I think you have to remember here that this isn't a walk away remedy. There's gonna be lots of monitoring done after the fact. And in addition, the site remedy is evaluated every five years to ensure that it's doing what it's supposed to do. And also institutional controls, as we call them, are put in place. These are kind of legal and administrative measures. Um, for the plant site, for example, we will want to limit, you know, as an example, limit excavation, prevent damage to any cap that's there and also minimize direct exposure to the contaminants. There's groundwater use restrictions we're going to implement, which, which could be a city or county ordinance to prevent people from drilling groundwater, groundwater wells near the plant site. And so in any case, that just gives kind of an example of institutional controls that will be put in place. So this gives you a general idea of alternative two and the blue highlight of what components are part of alternative two. And for alternatives two, three, and five, we have containment elements. The containment elements is a vertical barrier, and we're gonna talk a little bit more in detail on this. A perimeter drain, an existing, continue to operate those existing trenches that, that are there, and add new, new trenches if needed. And the purpose is to have kind of a robust containment system that doesn't just depend on one aspect. It has multiple layers of technology to ensure that we do not contaminate the Pine River or let uh, contaminants migrate from the site. And then an engineered cap would be placed over the site, as you can see. Let's first talk about the vertical barrier. We basically are looking at sealable sheet piling. Obviously, all this has to be determined in the design. But to give you an example of what it could look like in terms of this sheet pile pounded into, into the ground. It's insta installed at the toe of the river and completely surrounds the site. Um, it's much more reliable than a slurry wall that's in place now, even though we're not going to remove the slurry wall that's there, but it's much more reliable. Um, it'll help contain the site in place, prevents offsite migration, and it's mainly for the upper portions of the site. This kind of gives you a general idea how the sheet piles are sealed. Also, there's a perimeter drain that's placed on the site. Um, it'll consist of a series of groundwater collection trenches and sumps. It's installed interior to the slurry wall. It's installed above that till unit, as Scott talked about. And the main purpose of this is to control the water levels in the site. You want to keep the water in. You don't want to let it go out. And so we're able to, through this trench, is control the groundwater elevation to prevent water from coming, like the Pine River, coming into the site. And so, as I said, it maintains an inward hydraulic gradient, as we call it. And this water will be treated at the on-site water treatment plant. Again, as I've talked a few times already, the existing Napple trenches, de Napple trenches, um, will add the new trenches if needed. It's installed exterior to the slurry wall and the riverbank. And again, installed like we installed the previous one where it's installed in the top of the till unit. 
and it collects both denapple and contaminated groundwater. Okay, again, that water will also be treated at the water treatment plant. An engineered cap, it kind of gives you a general idea of what this cap will consist of. It's much different than the soil cap that Velsicol put on the site. There's multiple layers to it, um, including a thick root zone to prevent the site, the, um, the cap from being damaged by frost. Let me go back up to that one. Hold on. And, and essentially, it, it addresses risks and prevents people from being exposed to the material. It prevents anything from volatilizing. And it also prevents infiltration because we don't want water flowing into the cap because that'll just make us pump more groundwater and have to treat more water. So alternative three, it builds on alternative two and is, as I mentioned previously, addresses those areas, those denapple areas and those source areas. You can see the two areas that Scott mentioned previously, those are gonna be treated by something called in situ or in place thermal treatment. And we'll discuss that here in a little bit. Those two areas in yellow, those areas will be excavated and taken off site for disposal. And then the two green areas will be uh, treated by something called in situ or in place chemical oxidation. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here shortly. And of course we have to do a lot of bench scale, pilot scale and design work before this will get implemented. But mainly, as Scott mentioned, this is the most heavily contaminated areas on the site, and this is how we're proposing to address those areas. For example, you're looking at likely well over 10,000 gallons of Dean Apple being recovered. This is kind of gives you a schematic of an in situ or in place thermal treatment system. What it is is that essentially rods are drilled into the ground and they put electricity on those rods and heat up the soil to very high temperatures. It actually can boil off the contaminants and we capture those contaminants in a treatment system. So in any case, it's been used at a number of sites. This gives you an example of a smaller system that's been used, but you can see even a resident nearby in terms of, of the treatment. Um, there's certainly water treatment, there's um, heating elements, there's uh, water treatment, um, vapor treatment, vapor recovery. So it's a pretty sophisticated system and it's very effective to, for addressing denapple. This gives you an example of a site much more complicated uh, being performed. It actually is treating uh, one of the chemicals that Scott mentioned, DBCP, the 1,2-dibromo-3-chloropropane, which is a um, former soil fumigate that is a male sterility agent in very low concentrations. So this kind of gives you an idea of what it could likely look at, look like on the Velsicol site. And this technology, even though it's fairly new and it's been used in the oil industry before, it's been used quite frequently for Dean Apple sites. And this is kind of an older figure, but we've used it at more sites, but it has been used in a number of sites. And as I mentioned previously on the two areas that were referenced in green there, um, we plan to do in-place chemical oxidation. What this is is basically we inject chemicals into the ground. Those chemicals come in contact with the contaminants and they basically make a harmless byproduct to the contaminants. So, as I said, you took, take a chemical, an oxidant, something like hydrogen peroxide, which everyone is aware of. That is injected into the ground, it comes in contact with the contaminant and you get harmless byproducts. So it's really important to match the right oxidant or right chemical that's gonna treat the contaminants there. And we'll need to do some studies associated with that. And then of course, you need to get that oxidant, let's say for example, hydrogen peroxide to the contamination. So it's really important that the hammer must hit the nail. So it's very, very important that when this chemical is injected that it gets to the contaminants. You can see just a couple examples of a small system of how the chemicals um, injected, and here's a much bigger system where there's a tanker truck and they're injecting the chemical into the, into the soils, and there may be multiple passes that's needed to destroy the contaminants in place. And it's been used at a number of Superfund sites, this technology. So go to alternative five, it does even more than alternative three. It addresses these light blue and dark blue areas by doing additional in-place treatment, both through additional chemical oxidation that we talked about, but also 
um, a mixing of the chemical in soils because the chemical oxidation process that I showed previously usually only works in saturated wet soils. This gives you an example of the in situ or in place soil mixing equipment that would be used for something like this for alternative five. Again, another example of the type of equipment that would be used. And then finally, alternative seven, which does a partial excavation of the site along with containment and uh, groundwater treatment and addressing the NAPL. Basically, the removal and treatment plan for alternative seven would be um, about 544, about 550,000 cubic yards of material would be excavated, and this would be dry soils on the site in that cross-hatched area. That material would be excavated and disposed of off-site. It does not include soils that are contaminated below the water table, and it also includes those in situ or in place methods that I talked about previously. The cap is a little bit different for alternative seven, that it's, um, it's similar but a little bit different, so it's, and it's, you can save a little bit of money by putting a less, um, less thick soil layer on the cap. So in any case, it's a little bit different cap than the other, two, other three alternatives. And so because you're doing uh, this excavation, you're, you can use a, a less stringent cap according to Michigan regulations. And this is kind of the, the slide that, you know, kind of shocks at least all of us, but you're looking at the costs associated with these alternatives. Um, as you know, we're proposing alternative three. This first, first line here is the capital cost. That's essentially the initial construction cost. This is the cost that would be associated with um, the site after the construction is complete, like running a water treatment plant, and this is a combined cost. And just to give you a general idea, this is probably the most expensive remedy that our region has proposed from a, a fund lead standpoint. And what that means is, is that because Velscall is bankrupt, the, and we only have about $15 million in the bankruptcy trust, but essentially the super fund, or which is basically from the taxpayers are paying for this cleanup. So when we look at the alternatives, when we look at the alternatives, we, we basically go through a series of criteria to address the alternatives. And, and we look at, the first one is overall protection of human health and the environment. Does the remedy protect humans and animals? And basically all alternatives that we take through detailed analysis have to do that. Is it compliant with the regulations? ARARS is kind of another word for regulations. Is this remedy, is it long-term effective and is it, is it permanent? Does the remedy, does it reduce the toxicity, mobility, and volume through treatment? The short-term effectiveness is what is the risk as you construct this remedy to the nearby residents and also the, the construction workers? In certain cases, for example, on this site, you look at the dibromochloropropane. That's a chemical that we would have to be very considerate of as we, as we do any work here because of the toxicity of it. Implementability, can this remedy be implemented? So we're comparing all the alternatives to each other using these criteria. There's cost, there's state acceptance, and then finally why we're here tonight is to at least present that to you and take your public comments on community acceptance. And this chart is in the fact sheet, so I'm not gonna go in detail. We're gonna go in a little bit more detail in a little bit when we compare the alternatives, but if you wanna look at this, this kind of gives you a general idea of how we compared each of the alternatives to each other. And so both the state and EPA, we've been working really hard together, and we've, we're proposing alternative three as the best alternative tonight. And the state has given its concurrence with alternative three, and that's, that's kind of important because how this site remedy is gonna be paid for is for the construction costs, basically EPA pays for 90% of those construction costs and the state pays for 10%. Then there's a period of time after the site is constructed where you shake down the site remedy which can go for 10 years. EPA will continue to pay for that 90% of that and the state will pay for 10% of that. 
after this 10 years, if, if the remedy's operating as designed, the state has to pay for all of it. So essentially the cost to run the water treatment plan and all the things on the site to maintain it for all the alternatives is in the range of four and, four and a half million dollars a year. So you know, we have to work together as a team to be able to move this project forward. So in any case, why alternative three? That's kind of the question. When you compare alternative three to alternative two, which is a strict containment alternative, we have the same containment alternatives, the same cap, but we do do this additional treatment on site for the two um, DNAPL areas using the in-situ thermal treatment and also the four potential source, source areas are addressed. So give you kind of a volume of the materials that we'll be addressing on the site. Again, alternative three, it's much more complex to implement than two, and it also costs almost $50 million more in, in cost. But the reliability of it is much less than alternative three. Okay, you're talking about us spending $100 million protecting the Pine River, and the highest concentrations of contaminants will be addressed by those areas that were spelled out in previously. So it basically protects not only the river, but it also prevents um, receptors from being exposed to the site in alternative three in a much better way than alternative two. Comparing alternative three to alternative five, again, same thing, same cap components, uh, identical treatment of the two areas uh, for a thermal treatment, um, identical um, offsite disposal of the two potential source areas, identical treatment of the in place chemical oxidation, but alternative five, if you remember, adds all that additional treatment that I showed in light blue and dark blue previously of about 475,000 cubic yards. Um, we looked at this alternative and we see limited benefit with respect to doing this additional treatment for the soils because it really doesn't improve the amount of groundwater we have to treat. It's $43 million more expensive and also the large amount of risk we would see during construction. Now comparing alternative three to alternative seven, again, all the in-place treatments the same. You have a less stringent landfill cap for alternative seven, no vertical barrier, but you do excavate about 550,000 cubic yards of material from alternative seven, mainly the dry material. The wet material on the site in the upper part of the site remains in place. And we evaluated that and compared that to alternative three and we see that we don't see additional risk benefit from doing that excavation. You're talking in the neighborhood of one of 31,000 trucks that would leave the site likely. Um, you still have over 500,000 cubic yards of contaminated soil in the upper part of the site that's saturated that would not be removed. It removes a lot of heavily contaminated material. We did move a lot of material in the sediment cleanup off site, but that was much lower in concentration compared to what would be moved here. Um, you have tremendous amount of risk to um, workers and local residents during this excavation, and it's over $100 million expen more expensive. One thing to keep in mind with the funding, and just to give you a general idea of EPA funding, as you said, we're paying about, we're paying 90% of the construction cost, which for alternative three is about $143 million. EPA in general, on a, on a, on a decent year, for these kind of sites gets about $5 million a year. On a really good year, we get $10 million a year. So you're talking about a number of years, whatever we do, that will basically take to clean the site up. So it kind of just gives you a general, I mean, we could get more, we could get less, but I'm just giving you on terms of averages of what we've seen in previous years. So I, th I thought we'd give you a little bit of animation here and to just to give you an overview of our alternative three on what it does. We see groundwater contamination at the site, just examples of different types of groundwater contamination we see. As you move forward, you see Dean Apple present, you see the brown areas, there's some at 100 feet, there's some in the area over here where we'll be doing thermal treatment. So the first phase in regards to the cleanup would be cleaning up the residential properties. Okay, bringing equipment in there, 
haul that off for offsite disposal. That will be done. That will be done hopefully sometime this summer, starting this summer. This gives you this, the sealed sheet pile wall around the entire site. This is the NAPL collection trench, okay, that will help prevent contaminated groundwater and denapple from getting into the river or migrating from the site. There's this deep NAPL collection system that's at 100 feet that will pump the NAPL from, from the depth at, a, at 100 feet. There's a perimeter drain, as I remember I talked previously about the perimeter drain, in which it helps maintain the ground, groundwater into the site so it doesn't leave the site. So it's a trench that's gonna be put inside the slurry wall that will help control the groundwater and that's treated on site. With the new sheet pile wall, there's gonna be areas that will get, need to get filled. We'll, we'll clean these areas up on the site and then clean, put clean fill there. The potential source areas one and two, these areas here, if I can get it here, and here will be excavated and taken off site. These areas, a three and four, will use that chemical oxidation where we'll inject chemicals into the ground. It will hit the groundwater and destroy the contaminants. We have these two large areas of about 12 acres for thermal treatment. The engineered cap would put in place a multi-layered cap, which consists of not only compacted clay, but a very thick layer of plastic that seals. So there's kind of a multiple barrier that helps prevent infiltration of water into the, into the site waste. Much, much different than what the cap is there in place currently. Groundwater tra extraction system is put in place along with the groundwater treatment system. As over time, you will see groundwater um, levels outside the site be reduced. Over time, you'll see it being reduced and there's the finished site conditions. So that kind of gives you a general overview of our preferred alternative, why we chose that alternative. I know we kind of went fast through the slides and there's certainly a lot of information that is available for you to read. And um, there's a number of websites that are available that you can look at. Um, again, the public comment period ends April 7th. Here's a link, and I'll keep this link up, so if you want to copy that down, it gives you direct access to the, a long version of the proposed plan, the fact sheet, um, a way to comment electronically. You can go to the, the library that the site record is in the library. In addition, there is a, a citizens group called the Pine River Superfund Citizens Task Force. They have a web page. EPA gives them grant money to promote you know, information to the public. They actually are allowed to hire a consultant to help them to evaluate the technical documents. And so I encourage you to go onto their web page if possible that has a lot of good information. So I guess we're probably ready for, for questions. I was glad to see a few people came down and, uh, and put their names on the sign-in sheet. If you didn't receive a fact sheet in the mail, uh, you just put your name on the sign-in sheet and we'll make sure that you get the, the next fact sheet that's issued. And we've got some extra copies of the fact sheet for any of those that didn't get those. So, uh, you know, we're going to start the Q&A, uh, but then again, you know, to mention, we've got Mac TV here, and uh, the only way, you know, we've only got so many cameras, and that's why we set up this podium and mic. So if you could come down and state your name for our court reporter, if it's difficult, please spell it too, and uh, ask your question, and Tom and Scott will respond. And uh, anyone who'd like to come forward, we can start now. Uh, good evening. My name is Peter Defer, D-E-F-U-R. And for the audience, I've been working on this site for about two and a half years. I'm the technical advisor to which Tom referred. I work for the Pine River Citizens Task Force. And so I have read uh, the feasibility study and looked at the proposed plan that came out just recently. Um, so I have a couple of comments and uh, a couple of questions one of which I think I've asked these guys before, and, and it's sort of an ongoing question. Um, my comment to the audience is they did a good job uh, summarizing a lot of very difficult technical information. Um, it's a very tough site because there's a lot of stuff there, and I think they did a, a good presentation. So 
If there's something that you don't get, please ask them. Uh, the two questions that I have, um, one of them that you've heard before has to do with the groundwater underneath the site. Um, the city is right now drawing water from about 200 feet, right? And those wells are going to be turned off and replaced with a different system. So they're not going to be operative here. And that withdrawal of water from underneath the site will not be replaced by some other withdrawal of water. Because the collection system at the perimeter will be only collecting shallow water. What does that do? What does that change in that 200 foot withdrawal do for the movement of contaminants underneath the site? We looked at that issue, and we find that when we do our hydraulic containment, we will actually have wells down in the deep aquifer. They will be drawing from the deep also with alternative three. So we will be withdrawing water from the same place that the city's drawing water from right now. We don't expect that turning off the wells at the city will make a difference in flow of groundwater. The groundwater is still going to flow in the same direction. It's still, you know, the shallow groundwater especially is still going to uh, either enter the river or the river is going to come back into the groundwater depending if it's a losing or gaining stream, depending where you are in the, in the uh, river stretch and the impoundment. We also looked at uh, the cost of doing that, and that's why we wanted to turn those uh, wells off at the city because we will not have to pump as much groundwater or pump as hard to capture the groundwater and that will save us money in the overall remediation. So we're expecting that it, the change will be good and will benefit the alternative. One, one thing to add to Peter, we did model that. If you look at the modeling report that's in the, and completed by uh, CH2M Hill, that they, we did look at that in terms of the capture zone with the well field turned off and things like that. So we did actually evaluate that. Okay, good. The other question is one that I've not brought up before, and I don't know why this trip is the first one where it occurred to me. Um, but the, the chemical plant had an air plume and I'm sorry? an air emission plume. And I, I would expect that whatever was in the emission was over residential properties. And I've worked on a couple of other sites where those air emissions have been responsible for contaminating residential yards a quarter of a mile, half a mile away, depending entirely on the nature of what the plant was like. Were there any samples taken, for example, between where we are now and the plant site there? Because there are a fair number of residential properties there. Yeah, we, we set up a boundary where we kept moving out from the plant site. And, that, and that's what we believe happened in the residential areas, that some of the uh, material that was released at the site f was taken by the wind and blown off site onto those properties. We also did a study downwind of the burn pit area, which is another Superfund site and used to be the disposal area, a burning area for Velsico. And we looked at that area too. And we did not find that plume signature like you would for like a smelter or something like that. So the properties, the residential properties between here and the site right. are okay? Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have several. Uh, my name is Greg, G-R-E-G, -E -G. S is in Sam, I-E, F like in Frank, K-E-R. I'd like to start first. At the beginning of your presentation, you said that you had gone to your superiors and they have signed off on the plan? Not yet. Okay. Because if they have, I, I don't know why we're here. No, the, no. I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe I misspoke or you misunderstood. The thing is, is that... It, we take the comments until April 7th. Then we look at those comments and evaluate the remedy, okay, and how the, how the community 
takes to the remedy, then we make the decision. So the rem that's why we're here. The remedy has not been chosen yet. All right. On a scale of one to 10, the areas inside the orange fences on Bankston Street, on Delaware Street, and the streets in between, what would you say would be the severity of the level of contamination? Well, it wouldn't be a scale of one to 10. It would be, it either exceeds the part 201 direct contact criteria for either DDT or PBB. If it's over that, we put a fence around that area. And if it was below that, we wouldn't put a fence around it. But what so I'm asking is, what it, is the danger level to the residents of the area? on a scale of one to 10, is it an eight, is it a six, is it a four, a three? It, it's a, it's a low, it's a low uh, risk to the area. It does exceed the direct contract uh, number, which is calculated on a risk base. And that risk has a lot of assumptions that you spend a, a number of time right in the material and you know that you're a cert you live there a certain amount of time and you you know drink two liters of water and things like that and so those numbers are what we use to uh, gauge whether we should take an action or not and that's what we found is that they exceed those numbers but we had uh, risk assessors come to this come to the uh, citizens advisory group meetings and talk a little bit more about that and they believed uh, Milk Clark from EPA believed that the, the risk was low uh, for those, and the, the fences are really precautionary uh, just to keep kids out of playing in that material. The thing is, is that we did evaluate it twice, actually, EPA did for an emergency removal. We have like a long, a program like we're in now, a long-term health effects called the remedial program. We also have the removal program, and they came twice our risk assessors and looked at that, if it was levels were high enough, we would have came immediately, and we do that a lot throughout the region of excavating areas because of an emergency level, because we felt that, you know, we couldn't leave that in place. The, the effects inside those fences is, is a long, long-term risk, okay? Um, maybe I missed it, but on your alternative three, that includes excavation of some of the material and haul off-site? Yes. Is it possible that instead of trucking all of that down a residential street, you could build your own road inside the fence out to 46 so that we don't have contamination in our yards? Yes, that's been suggested at a number of meetings we've been at by the residents and we've worked with uh, the Michigan Department of Transportation and there will be a gate down on 46 and we will not go through the uh, residential areas anymore with that trucking. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we understand, and I think that we'll work with the community on that. How much money has been allocated for the future in the event that your monitoring system shows a recurrence of contamination? Well, we evaluate sites every five years. We haven't put any money aside in so, terms of that we put like a slush fund aside that if there's a there's problem. No, there's nothing there for that. So right, if but, you find contamination, but, there's no guarantee then that you'll have the, that the money will be there to correct that situation. I, I wouldn't say, I'd say there is a guarantee that there'll be money. I can't say how much, but if we look at these sites every five years and evaluate them, and if there's a problem, then we have to come back and address it. And the community's all involved in that. So there isn't though any like, like as I said, a, a trust fund put aside that deals with that. We just deal it as an as needed basis. We hope we don't have to come back and do anything, but there are procedures in place if we do to address that issue. Have you made any provisions at all to remove residents from the area downwind for a couple blocks or even a quarter of a mile while you're doing all of this excavation? You know, we don't, right now we're in the middle, you know, we haven't started the design yet of that, you know, we're just at the, at the remedy decision point. But we look at the levels that are currently there, they're very low compared to the levels at the plant site. In addition, the constituents that are in the actual 
soils, the DDT and PBB aren't volatile, we will be required to use engineering controls. Like for example, it may be a super windy day, we'll decide not to excavate that day, or we'll use certain agents to help prevent dust. We don't, you know, I don't want to go in there and excavate these areas and just spread it all over. So there will be controls in place. We'll be doing air monitoring and things of that nature to ensure that we aren't making a problem worse. So yeah, there will be things in place, but we do not anticipate the need to move anybody based upon the, the constituents and the levels that we're seeing in the soil. Okay. Guys, <clears throat> my name is Ron Acton, A-C-T-O-N. A couple of questions here for you. Uh, how long do you expect this to take, time frame wise? Okay, I can give you my spiel. I mean, I hope it's quick. I mean, certainly if we got all the money at once, it would be much quicker, but you can't expect that. This could take as, as long as 10 plus years. 10 to be plus honest. years. As I said, the EPA, based on it, because the site company's bankrupt, certainly there are things we're going to do immediately. As soon as we choose the remedy, that $15 million that's in the trust fund, $6 million immediately goes to the city of St. Louis to start their design of their municipal drinking water supply. Mm -hmm. And we have additional monies in that trust fund to address the cleanup of the residential area. We then will be doing concurrently a lot of sampling on the site to do for design work. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take some time. But I, as I said, we could get $5 million a year, $10 million a year. So, you know, you're talking could be 10 years easy. Okay. The river cleanup took what, six years? Yeah. Six years. Yeah. So it's going to take a while, unfortunately. We also have a, a, a question on does the shield extend above ground? How, how much are you going to raise that shield? It will be, that's a good question. We had that question actually recently. It won't be that much. You're talking about the, the sheep pile wall. It'll only be a little bit above. There'll be a cap on it. It will not be this huge wall. You know, you'll still be able to see the site if you're, you're um, canoeing down the Pine River. Okay. <clears throat> the case well, certainly the aesthetics are important. I mean, they're important to you and important to us too. Okay. <clears throat> Obviously, we went through six years of it before. Well, one thing to keep in mind, you know, there's the sheet pile walls that are in place there right, right now. We may need to use that during the actual construction, so we're keeping it in place, but that will be removed. Okay. okay. Right. And this current, the slurry wall, or the sheet pile wall that's planned will not be that far out into the river. Okay. okay. Uh, <clears throat> reading over the literature, I'm just curious about that statement about deed restriction. Could you explain that, please? It's basically a legal document that prevents, for example, we would not want any digging into the cap. I mean, you could put mm -hmm. like a light building on it, something like that, and we're going to have to have a, a large building on the site for the water treatment plant. But, for example, we wouldn't want anybody to build a house on that cap. Okay, okay so it's kind of those kind of its legal requirements for the plant site itself. Now, for the residential properties, there'll be no deed restriction. The only restriction we kind of think off-site that could come into play is we want to prevent the installation of any groundwater wells in that area, which could affect our groundwater system and change the flow of groundwater and make us treat more water. So there could be yeah. a city ordinance of that effect. But from the residential perspective, we don't see any type of restriction. So you don't think that the <clears throat> state of Michigan would have to be like... Uh, now, if you sell a home, you have to basically go through <clears throat> and have a home inspection, but you have to declare certain things. You're telling me that this wouldn't have to be declared on a bill of sale? If I, you come across contaminated, and I'm sure everybody here has got property or concerned right, about right. that. Right, right. I think, no, I don't think so. I think we, you'll actually have a letter from us that we've cleaned up your property. So, in terms of a restriction based on that, no. Yeah, okay. This would not be, okay. <clears throat> How long will it, well, I, I got that. Um, I know you said 10 years, correct? The state? It could be longer. Okay, what I mean, about? I'm just being honest with you. Okay. <clears throat> what about payment? Let's say that, uh, you know, physically right now, uh, Financially, <clears throat> we're at sixteen trillion dollars of debt. The federal and the state is also in debt. So, we're curious about where the money's going to come from. 
There's a, an actual super fund in place that has usually our budget in a year, and these numbers change, but to clean up these type of sites nationwide, the budget is around $250 million a year across okay. the EPA. Could shrink, could grow, I don't know, you know, but I'm just giving you what I know in terms of averages and things. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be tough to get the money, but we're going to take the best we can and try to get it. You know, well, I think what people are here concerned about is if it's going to be a stop and go situation, we're going to be living with a, with a, with a problem, a quality of life for a lot of years. And that's what the people here are concerned about is, you know, we live here. You know, we have to get up in the morning and listen to the noise and the dust and the construction costs. So obviously we're concerned about our quality of life. I, I agree. You know, it's certainly there, there are issues, you know, with, in this site there'll be big heavy equipment there at times, you know, there'll be some noise. I mean, I can only say that we're going to try to get this done. Yeah. It's certainly a priority for our region. It's, let's face it, it's, fat, it's, more, it's cheaper if we can do it quicker. You know, when I have to, let's say, for example, we can only install half the wall, it's more expensive for this, for the remobilization of all the equipment and things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're going to try to work. We're going to work the best we can to try to get this thing moving and get it done in as short a time as possible. Yeah. But I, I'm only giving you the, you know, to be honest with you, the realities of the situation with yeah. money. It's tough. Well, that's what we're living with, too, is the reality of the site. So, right. I know. And you know we're, we'll, we're, we'll get it addressed. I you promise you. You guys but, go home, we stay here. Well, you know, that's what we're concerned about. And I think everybody here thinks the same way. So I think that should be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Gary Smith, S-M-I-T-H. <laughs> uh, well, I think it's right anyway. So uh, yeah, I think it would be possible that uh, we could probably uh, debate the merits of the, of the proposed remedies longer than it would probably take to actually implement them. So what I'd like to do is kind of look to the future. Like uh, when the former plant site has been remediated and the time has come to, to put it to its intended use. So the question I'm going to try to ask here is, is when the project is completed, and you've achieved all of your stated remedial action objectives, will the EPA or the DEQ stand in the way of the fences coming down? Now, in the proposed plan, it's acknowledged that the EPA and the DEQ assisted the City of St. Louis in 2002 when the City undertook a community-based planning process to develop future land use recommendations and a conceptual reuse strategy of the former plant site. Uh, in the proposed plan, it also states commercial redevelopment may be feasible along M46 corridor, but low impact recreational redevelopment is the most likely, especially considering the site is adjacent to the Pine River. The proposed plan references the city saying they strongly support using the former plant site for recreational use. And the former plant site is owned and maintained by an independent custodial trust, the Lepetamine 3, and I believe they are fully aware of all of these happenings. So it seems most likely the city will become the owner of the former plant site and will utilize the property as I've already stated. And one sentence in the proposed plan is defined the remedial action objectives as this. The remedial action objectives prevent exposure by human, by both human and ecological receptors to the site-related contaminants in the soil and groundwater. So it's my expectation, if not everyone else's in this room, that these, once these objectives are met uh, with the remedy that's, or excuse me, these objectives that be met with the remedy that's implemented. So should this occur and the remedial action objectives are met and all parties involved with the reuse of the former plant site adhere to ensuring the finished site remediation is not affected by its reuse, 
with the exception of your pump and treat system or maybe some other structure that you need to have a fence around for security reasons. Uh, will you, the EPA, Don, Scott, DQ, in any way object or prevent the new owner of the former plant site from removing the remaining fences if they so choose? And if there is an objection or there is an intention or possibility of preventing it, given this scenario, please answer why. Well, I, I guess the way you stated it, uh, we would say that our, our intentions have always been to redevelop this site into a recreational uh, area working with the city. Uh, the EPA gave a grant uh, for the city to and this community to do the planning for that and we see that as the long-term end use so the the fences will eventually come down but like you mentioned there are some areas the wastewater treatment plant uh, that will need a security fence around it but other than that we anticipate you know in the long term when this is all completed that it will be open and you know we hope that there will be a a uh, way to work out the transfer of the property from, you know, the trust that owns it right now to whoever, if the city's interested, and we'd have to talk to them about their interest. But, uh, you know, it's, I think we're all on the same page with that. And, and I can, as long as the site is properly maintained, and that's the issue, and we talked about this some, I know, the last few days, is the site is properly maintained because this isn't a walkaway remedy. If it's properly maintained, there's going to be no issue with the fences. And that's kind of the, the, the obviously, there's the devils in the details in terms of how the, 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 um, the maintenance has worked out. But we would not have given you a large grant to do this community plan if we didn't want this to happen. And so, yes, there is possibilities, but we have to ensure that that site is maintained properly. Because the cap, it just doesn't walk away and it's going to sit there forever. People have to do things to it to make sure and fill in, you know, burrowing holes, things of those natures that are done throughout the country in all kinds of landfills. So I don't see an impediment to, to removing the fences other than if we get insurances that the site's going to be maintained properly. Fair enough. Thanks. I'm unclear on a couple of things. Sure. Can you tell me how much is allocated for that site total? Do you mean right now? You're yeah. Talking how, how, what is the projected cost? Oh, total. The three hundred and seventy-three yeah, right. million. The construction costs or the capital cost. I can go to the slide here. Bear with me. One hundred and forty-three million dollars is to. Sorry, I'm gonna. Take That's all right. Time to get there. It's 143 million dollars to um, construct the site. EPA pays 90 percent of that. Okay, the state has to pay 10 percent of that. Then it goes into a period of time where the system is sh is shaken down, and what happens is is that we still pay 90 percent, and that's about four and a half million dollars a year to treat the groundwater and do all the maintenance activities. Okay, we still pay 90 percent of that. All right, and then after 10 years, the state pays it all. So we've got $15 million right now, six million, as soon as we make a remedy decision, our managers sign off and make the decision, $6 million goes to the city of St. Louis. We then take the remaining portions and start the design work, and, well, start the cleanup of the um, residential properties. EPA pays for 100% of all the design activities. And certainly there's been money that's been allocated for that. And, you know, we're just going to have to work through our budgets as we move forward. So there's this whole money has not all been allocated now. All right. My next question is simply AIG plays into this because they're the insurance company. How much money are they contributing to this? They, and they basically put in $15 million for this site. There also was a settlement with the city of St. Louis in which AIG put in $20.5 million for replacement of the city well field. All right, the, the $15 million, is that pigeonholed to this site, or does that go into the Superfund site no. to be used by any? It's, it's, there's a trust that was formed. 
that's managing that money. There was more money that was obtained in this settlement from AIG, and Dulce Call had other sites, and monies were allocated to each of those sites. This site got about $15 million. Jim Hall, H-A-L-L. <laughs> uh, I'm going to kind of piggy up with, with uh, what, what Gary said on long term, and I don't know what, if, what you guys' plans are on this, but a good friend of mine used to be mayor, and he did this um, fish and derby, and I know it was always his dream as well as mine. And I don't know if you've worked or are going to be working with fish and uh, wildlife. Do you think... Is it part of your plan to ever have the advisory removed? I don't know, it's not the EPA's deal, but what do you think? Is that a dream or is that just not going to happen? It's, I think it's going to happen eventually. After the sediment removal was conducted, we've been monitoring the fish. Uh, DEQ has monitored the fish under the Fish Consumption Advisory Program. And the community, the Department of Community Health actually sets those uh, advisories, but we're watching the levels and it's, you know, it's the hope that after removing all the contaminated sediment out of that one area that the fish advisory will eventually be removed. You have to wait for the, the population to turn over, so to speak. The old fish die off who are contaminated, the new fish grow up without the contamination so they can't absorb it. But one thing to keep in mind too is, is that we will be beginning you know, as I, as I told previously, downstream from the St. Louis Dam, the state has done some sampling that showed some elevated levels of DDT in sediment. We'll be looking at those and doing some additional sampling and fish sampling and things like that over time. You know, we'll probably start that investigation sometime this fall and essentially be looking even farther downstream to address the risks associated with, with the, in the Pine River downstream. So, I mean, it is a goal of ours. We don't set the fish advisors, it's obviously, but we would love to see where at least PBB and DDT aren't, aren't um, issues for the fish in the Pine River. I can't guarantee you about mercury or PCBs, which seems like it's in most Understood. every Understood. every river, but. As well as, um, in, in, in 82, we talked about the consent and judgment, and we didn't have a, a voice at all, so we are truly thankful you give us a voice and a message and will there ever be let's say you're going to give us three what you're leaning toward if that's not working somehow will you hybrid it with a with a different one yeah and that there yes we will and, and if it's not working but the thing is is that the community will be involved throughout the process if we find something unusual or new as we move forward you know, it isn't going to be done in a vacuum like the, the consent judgment was done in the 80s. And, you know, I encourage everyone, you know, to, if they're really interested, you know, every third Wednesday of the month, there's the, the, the CAG meetings that are a great source of information for people. But it won't be done in a vacuum. I promise you that. Thank you. That's all I got. Appreciate your hard work. Hi. My name is Stephen Boyd. Uh, used to live in St. Louis. I live in East Lansing now. Um, I just had some kind of technical questions, I guess, about these three types of uh, treatments that are involved in this uh, option three, the excavation, the chemical oxidation, and the thermal treatment. What is... Um, what is it that defines um, the treatment that is used? Um, in other words, there's an area that you're going to excavate. Why are you excavating that area versus doing chemical oxidation or thermal treatment? So for each of these areas, is it the type of chemical, the, the concentration, or what that, that um, drove you to select these various treatment approaches for these different areas? 
Yes, it, it's both of those with some other uh, parameters. When we did the remedial investigation, we tried to determine what chemicals we found in which areas of the site. Based on the chemicals that we found and the concentrations that we found them in, we went and looked for the, the uh, technologies that could actually uh, destroy uh, or reduce those chemicals. When we looked at the, uh, the areas that were in the orange, can you find that? Uh, we found that those areas had the, the, that Dean apple in them, that heavy material, which is highly toxic, and the DBCP uh, material. So this is the excavated? No, that, this is the, where we're gonna do the thermal treatment. And we're gonna do the thermal treatment in place so that we don't expose anybody to the DBCP, especially. But it also volatilizes, turns that, put, to, turns that Dean apple into vapor that we can collect and remove it from the site completely. Uh, that the, the uh, vapor will be removed. And that, and that way we remove that chemical and that chemical is no longer a source to groundwater. It's no longer a risk at that site for those two areas. In the two areas that will be excavated, the, the chemicals weren't highly mobile and they're in the dry soil. So we were able to go in, even though they're at high concentrations, we can go in and take, you know, kind of surgically take those two areas out of there. So and that's, that's where the DDT and the PBB right. is at high levels yep. primarily? Yes. That's what's driving the well, excavation. there's chlorobenzene there's, in some of those there's, areas. There's too. some chlorobenzene also, mm -hmm. and, but, but it's in the dry soil. That's, that's one of the keys there. Where we're going to use the chemical oxidation, it was in the, the groundwater. It was down underneath in, in the water, and we couldn't actually go in there, technology, and, and start digging that up. You know, it would be like digging in a mud puddle. You don't get much. So we're going to use in place chemical oxidation, again, to break those chemicals down so that they're, they're not toxic, they're not a problem, and they're not a source to groundwater. So in the chemical oxidation, what, what are the target, the primary target chemicals? Do we have that? Uh, off the top of my head, in, in area four, it's phthalate, and I think area three, it's uh, DDT. Area three, area three. HPB and, yeah. HPB and DDT in area three. In area four, it's uh, bis 2 ethyl hexyl phthalate. Yeah. Okay, and that's why it's in the actual saturated portion, and so chemical oxidation works well with that. So and that's in the, if you go in the long version of the proposed plan, there's, I don't know if you've seen the 65 or eight page version, no, then, um, it's on that link, and I'll get you a link if you want to see. You can read it. It goes into all that detail. Yeah. Um, let's see. So the thermal treatment, going back to that, you, you said that was uh, aimed primarily at the dichlorobromopropane and Napple. the napple. Yes, and what does the napple consist of? Um, there's two types of napple on the site. There's... Uh, DDT that's dissolved in chlorobenzene, and if you remember that picture I showed of that black goo, uh -huh. okay, and then the second one is, um, I think it's tetrachloroethylene with a number of brominated compounds associated with it, so there's two types, because they did do bromine chemistry there, and they made all these brominated compounds, yeah. so. So in the thermal treatment, those will be um, volatilized, turned into gases, and then captured, and treated, and recovered. Uh -huh. And the chemical oxidation, you said it was salate and DDT? Eight hexabromobenzene. Hexabromobenzene. And when you do this oxidation, you, you say that it turns it into harmless products. It's, it's a chemical reaction that breaks it down. Yeah. 
And don't forget, one thing to keep in mind that I didn't mention is, is that there will be, after those treatment is done, we go in there and do borings to verify that we've met the cleanup numbers. So, you know, particularly with the oxidation, there may need to be multiple injections mm -hmm. that are done, but you go in there to verify that you've met the, the criteria, the cleanup criteria. Yeah. So the, the compounds that are there are, will disappear, they'll be converted to something else. But how, how can you be assured that those new compounds are, in fact, harmless? We'll be doing sampling in, in wherever we're doing the, the sampling. I mean, mm -hmm. where we're doing the treatment, we'll do sampling. And, and then, we'll, the, okay, so you take a sample and then... It's well, analyzed. Let's, let's back up a bit. Before we even go in and do that, we'll have bench studies, uh -huh. which means that we'll, be, we'll in a laboratory, uh, conduct studies that show us that the thermal treatment and the chemical oxidation will break down the chemicals that they're targeted to break down. And then we'll do a pilot study, a smaller version of what we want to do out on site to, make, to continue to assure us that that will work. And then we'll go into full scale. And after full scale, then we come back in and take the samples to verify that the chemicals have been broken down, that the byproducts or the remaining, uh, what's left after you break them down is not a problem either. Yeah. And, and that's something that we've got, you know, that will be all in the uh, design documents, how to do that. Well, the last thing we want to do is turn something into, you know, you see that sometimes where chemicals break down in the environment and it turns into something sometimes even more toxic yeah. than the original thing. So w will the goal be to identify the chemicals that are formed or will there be some kind of toxicity testing that would tell you that it's been rendered less toxic? We'll do a laboratory analysis of the samples. To, to identify full the suite of, For right. a full, we'll suite of, full suite of chemicals. Uh -huh. Okay. And then, uh, and then the, for the uh, Dean Apple, um, it says in that, this document that there's an aggressive plan to deal with that. And could well, you tell me again what? Okay. What well, the, there, there's a couple ways we're going to deal with that. We're going to deal with that with the thermal treatment in those in those two areas. We're also we also have a right now we have a collection trench which is collecting it. Uh, Tom told you about 300 gallons a a year of that in that trench. We may have to extend that trench depending on what we see during our uh, design sampling. Uh, we also have a sump that goes down at least one sump that goes down to about 99 feet where we found an apple, and we're gonna pump that right out of there. We're gonna collect it and pump it out. So that's what we mean by an aggressive thing. We're gonna destroy or remove the apple so that we basically eliminate the source, and without a source, you won't have groundwater contamination. That's right. our goal. Yeah. And this is a source control remedy. That's, that's how we uh, will attack this problem. I think to keep in mind, like right now in that collection trench that we're operating that I mentioned, we're getting about 300 plus gallons of Dean Apple um, a year out of that. And that mixture is very heavily contaminated. So we have to take that mixture and it's likely the Dean Apple we discover on the site, you know, as, as we continue to operate these trenches and out of the sump, we'll have to likely dispose of that off site and what right. it's mixed with usually with fuel oil and then burned in an incinerator because mm -hmm. it's so toxic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think a, a, a real key is the, you know, source removal. Uh, right. And so that's, uh, yeah, that's good to hear that that's kind of a guiding. Right. And, and one of the, and one of the driving factors for that is the consideration that the state's going to end up with this site you know, after it's all said and done, we're gonna to have to operate this site and we wanna get rid of as much source as possible so that our costs down the road are less. Yeah. And the, uh, the new water system between St. Louis and Alma, is that gonna be a surface water source or a groundwater source? Um, we're not gonna speculate on it. it, likely will be a groundwater source. But the design, you know, they're, they haven't done the design yet, so. 
Because this or, doesn't Alma have a surface water? They, they do right now. They do have uh, some of their water is from a surface water source from the river, yeah. which they treat. Okay, so I think probably a groundwater source would be preferable. For I most, think that's a state's goals. Yeah. I think some of their water program's goals. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to speculate right now in terms of we certainly, <clears throat> as okay. we move forward, we'll keep everyone informed on yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Hornus, H-O-R-N-U-S. My question has to do with the funding of the project. Um, Michigan is kind of an economic dire straits. Um, and I understand that initially the state will only pay 10%, but in 25 years or so we will pay 100%. What happens if Michigan cannot afford to pay for that 10 or 25%? Does the project just get stopped? What's the answer to that? We, in my experience so far, I can't predict 25 years, but we've not seen any project in our region where the state hasn't eventually come up with the money. So that's just been my experience. Okay, if it, if Michigan didn't have much more recovery, um, is, is Michigan giving this a priority so that they will make sure the money is there? Yes, during the planning sessions that we've had for funding of all the sites in Michigan, this is a priority site. This is one of the biggest sites in the, in the state, obviously, and it's, it's been getting its pri the priority. Okay, thank you. you know, as I said, regarding, you know, we're, we're trying not to sugar, you know, we're just being honest up here in regards to the monies. I mean, it's tough out there right now, and certainly we're going to try our best, but I don't want to come here and give you any false sense of, of hope that this is going to be done in a couple years, because it's not. And just to interrupt for a second, we'll, we'll a couple of more questions that I will have to get to eventually at least by the, the next 15 minutes we'll have to get to the comment period so the people if they want to make more comments uh, other than the question. Uh, my name is Michael Rayley, R-A-L-E-Y, and I'm sort of new, I'm in Alma. So my question has to do partly with the relationship between the contamination here and the proposal to have new water supply coming between Alma and St. Louis. I was wondering, um, <clears throat> forgive me, because a lot of this is fairly new to me, um, but I was wondering, since you found an apple at, at levels of 99 feet, if there are, what the chances are that there are levels of an apple found that we haven't found or that you haven't found that might be deeper than that. And I'm wondering also about the degree of, if we know the degree of contamination of groundwater levels outside of the immediate area here, and if that could actually extend into the areas where we're proposed, where you may be proposing to have new wells. I don't know if they're new wells that are going to be dug for Alma and St. Louis. I'm a little unclear about that. Um, number, well, the, the latter question, no, it wouldn't extend to those locations. I think it's really important to, to say that there will be no wells drilled in the area that new wells drilled in the area that is going to have contamination in them. That sure. certainly isn't, isn't, we wouldn't allow that to happen. I guess the big thing with the groundwater, you look at the groundwater offsite, there's only a few areas where there's groundwater above drinking water standards. The, the chemical that's in the city's drinking water supply, the perichlorobenzene sulfonic acid, and then there's a couple other lower levels in that lower groundwater. So could there be denampled deeper than 100 feet? I mean, I, I don't do what ifs, I and mean, it could be, but I can tell you that the groundwater, if there was an extensive NAPL problem that deep, I think we would see much higher concentrations of contaminants in the groundwater than we do see. And as Scott mentioned, I don't know how many, 160 some wells have been drilled, and we've been sampling the city well field very frequently, and so in any case, we just don't see it. So. I mean, yes, it could be there. We don't see it as it's affected the, the groundwater. And I, I would expect from my, my experience that we would see a much bigger groundwater problem if we had it a lot deeper. And which way does the groundwater flow here? I mean, is, is there a direction to that flow? Go ahead. Yes, it flows basically from the site towards the dam down, down that way. You know where the dam is? Yes. Okay. Um, so, which, which so it's east. So it's, it's kind east. of an east. Of, you know, and it depends which 
which unit you're in. It's a little bit different in each unit, but it has a generally east flow. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marilyn Lorenz, I'm from Alma. And my question has to do with the vertical barrier. Um, how long do you think the vertical barrier will be effective? Like, I'm thinking, like, do you think it's going to be 50 years, it'll be, you know, perfectly effective in containing everything? And also the cap. How long do you think the cap will be effective? I, I was just wondering, like, I'm thinking of the grandchildren, the people here, mm -hmm. will they be back in, you know, 50 years saying, you know, we got a problem? No. The, the cap, if, if maintained, and it will be under an, uh, what we call an operation and maintenance plan, it, it will be inspected, it will be maintained, as uh, Tom has said. If there's a, you know, a gopher hole or a hole in it, we'll come out and, and fix that right away so we don't have erosion, you know, prevent erosion on the cap. That, that can last basically for perpetuity, as long as you continue to maintain it. It's like any structure, you know, you'll have to do some maintenance, but it continues on. Now, the, the soil barrier, the vertical sheet pile wall, mm -hmm. that's the same way. We have to, we have to monitor that and, and watch that and make sure that that stays intact. And there may be a time when, you know, if a sheet starts to have problems, you know, after 50, 60, you know, 100 years, whatever it's going to be for that thick metal, you'll have to pull that sheet and put another sheet in. You There's know, no possibility of contamination going underneath it. Well, we have multiple layers with, of the containment, and that's why we chose as our preferred remedy. It just isn't like the Velsicol site where they just had the slurry wall. There's, and not only that, the Velsicol never kept in the groundwater into the site, and that's one of the main keys. And so there's multiple containment barriers to prevent contaminants from leaving the site. You know, you can do certain things with sheet pile walls to do um, corrosion protection and all kinds of things to make them last for a long, long time. And, and one thing to keep in mind is, is that every five years, we have to go in and reevaluate the site remedy. Is this operating as designed? Is it still protective? And that's all part of the public process. And so in any case, um, nothing is forever, okay? But we do think with proper maintenance that this can last a long time. That may be more costly, though, for the state. Um, it could, but if it's maintained properly, then it, it essentially can last for a long time. Right. I just noticed that the option number three, the one that you chose, um, it isn't as permanent as number seven. And I guess I'm thinking more of permanence. But you say the reason it's not as permanent is because you constantly have to fix it up and maintain it and maintain it. Well, on either one of those, you'd have to have an operation and maintenance, because you have to remember there, seven doesn't take away all the uh, source. Seven leaves the source, stops at the water, the groundwater, the, the uh, underneath where you can only dig down to the, where the dry is, and then the rest of it's going to still be there. So you still have a containment system for seven. So you have the same, it's, it's the same O&M kind of issues. It's the same problems that you have with anything. When you do an O&M plan, you're out there, you know, quarterly inspecting it. And then what Tom was talking about is like a, a larger review of the overall remedy. But, but each component in the, in the treatment system, on that wall, on that cap, are all going to be maintained and monitored, you know, all the time. I mean, it's not, it's not going to be ignored or left alone. But I think when you talk about number seven, there's certainly you have to weigh a number of other factors other than that in terms of um, the, the yeah. treatment you're still going to have to do on site. You have a huge risk to the community in the local area with respect to excavating that, which could take many more years. You're talking $100 million more expensive, and we kind of weigh a number of those factors and those criteria verse each other, and, and from our, our analysis, both the state and EPA, is that the alternative three is the best balance of all of them. And so we look at that, and that's why we've chosen that as our preferred alternative. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, question or, or comment?
to do the last one and then. Uh, wait, 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 you come down here. Yeah. <laughs> If you want to talk into this one, you can. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious. What would happen if we didn't do anything? Um, you'd have potential of recontaminating the Pine River. A great potential right. to that. We've already spent a hundred million dollars cleaning right. that. Right. Okay. You have potential for additional groundwater contamination over the long term. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have um, unacceptable risk to people going on the site. You would not be able to reuse that piece of property at all. Okay, so there's a series of 56 acres. 52 acres. 52 acres. I mean, acres. part of that site is going to have to have a water treatment plant on it. Yeah, and so that's going to basically be fenced off. But a good portion of the site can be reused. Well, when I'm listening to all the figures, I keep thinking to myself, you know, eventually you're going to run out of contaminants. No. When you guys talk, it's like they self perpetuate. Well, they don't, they don't self perpetuate. And I think. Probably a lot of people aren't, be, aren't able to hear this, but he, he was asking, uh, eventually we'll run out of contaminants. And, and I guess in a, in a long time, there may be a possibility that the contamination will be removed and it will run out, but that's, that's a long time down the road. We, we've seen some pump and treats that have accomplished that have, you know, uh, basically lowered the groundwater levels to levels that were were not a risk. And what's a long time? Uh, 60, 100 years. So you've had places that you've been working yep. for 60, 100 years? Well, well you we, can look at the, I'll give you an yep. example of a site that's worked. Gratiot County Landfill with the mm -hmm. groundwater treatment system there. Right. They turned that system off. It worked for a number of years and it met the criteria mm -hmm. and they were able to turn it off. Here, the contaminants here, particularly on the site itself, are so high that you're talking geologic time before those would break down. So you're talking half life or oh, you're talking, you know, a lot of these compounds don't even break down. PEB, a fire retardant. So in any case, they will be there for a long, long, well, long time. I understand time. that, but I mean, how much was there? That's what I'm trying to understand. You well, guys keep talking about, you know, infinity. I keep thinking to myself. Got well, I, I guess we talk about infinity because it's hard to predict how much is going to be removed. You know, each year we can't calculate it out. We, you know, from our RI, our remedial investigation, we can estimate how much you know was there and how much we expect to be removed. But we don't know how fast we'll be able to remove it. So it's hard to give you a time frame about when that's all going to you know happen. When you know how long that's going to take. Okay. <clears throat> you know, because obviously it was an option. And you guys didn't address it. Otherwise, if there's an option... Well, we, we didn't address the no action. You're talking about the no action. Yeah, the no we action. We didn't address it because there was unacceptable risk. I mean, when we look at the site, first we sample and find out where the, what levels are in the in, at the site, where it's at, and then you do something called a risk assessment mm -hmm. where you look and you make assumptions about exposure and things like that, both future uh, current, future use, things of that nature. When you have that unacceptable risk under Superfund, that justifies us taking an action. Because I noticed in looking chronologically when you guys first looked at this site, is that you started in 1999, right? This is a sediment removal, yes. Correct. Right. Right. And I noticed it went through the 2006, correct? Correct. In 2004, you followed, I think you followed the Bad stuff, correct? In 2004? Yeah, about 2004, we yeah. discovered the Dean why, Apple. Why wasn't that address when you had the site open? It was. When we had the sediment cleanup, okay, that bad stuff, that Dean Apple, started flowing into the site. It's like if someone, when they did the sediment cleanup, Think about if you were laying there and someone was sitting on your chest. That's mm -hmm. the river. You took that, you took that river off and essentially it allowed that contaminants in the site to flow and it flowed into the river. Okay, that's when they started pumping all that material. They installed that collection trench to stop it from going into the river. If we don't continue to do that, eventually it's gonna get back into the river. Well, <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out that you have two years, okay? Okay. Yeah. It's 2004 to 2006 to address this. You put the trench in then? What? I don't remember. Yeah. I wasn't the project man. What was the trench? It's a little more complicated than just simple chronology. Yeah. Uh, you can look at that remedial action as taking the seven years to complete the 
that's an entirely different perspective than what we're looking at with our treatment, where we have this, this, this non aging example, which we know there's a lot out there, and we don't know exactly how much. No one has the records from the site whose introduction we have in the comments. You know, no, you gotta you gotta start the comments. We gotta yeah. we gotta break gotta here go, and, go. and go to comments. We're running out of time. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, yep. any anyone yeah. like to come forward to the microphone or should we take this down? You want to Well not a unlike question and answer, this is just your chance to and whatever it is, off your chest, or make a suggestion, it's just a straightforward comment or statement that's part of the part of Okay? And this is actually what we respond to. Okay, right. so when you make your comment, we actually will respond to that in writing. And, uh, and as well as the written one. So right. this is the chance to make an oral comment. Uh, but if you don't feel like we need tonight, there, feel free to, to uh, take advantage of a number of ways to make written copies. Anyone for oral comments? Get the ball over here. Right. Yeah, I'll get I'll get the ball rolling. It's Peter Defer. She's got a copy of my card. DEFUR, Environmental Stewardship Concepts. I'm the technical advisor for the Pine River Citizens Task Force. Uh, my comment to EPA and the state is that in the um, record of decision, the ROD to request a specific and detailed, uh, a specific section uh, that spells out uh, community protection for health and quality of life. Uh, the way that some of the other records of decision have done around the country, indicating what's going to be monitored in uh, general terms and how the community in the immediate area and the larger area will be will have their health and welfare protected. Thank you very much. Thank you. Someone else? Is Gary still here? No, no comment, no oral comment? No oral comments. No. Okay. Uh, I read the comments for the comments. All right, going once. Jeez. Going twice. I guess that's it. All right, thank you. Well. Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. Thank, thank you for coming. We really appreciate you spending your time tonight learning about the site, and we really look forward to having you comment and uh, working with the community and the city to resolve this problem. Thank you.